Well, welcome to part two. And um, this time I'm going to talk about Helen Duncan and Paramore. Paramore. Uh, take two. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take. Right, okay. So welcome to part two. We're going to talk about Helen Duncan and also about Paramore. Paramore. Paranormal. Uh, you can you can do this one. Go on, you can do it. I'm going to do something. Go on, go on. You can do it. You can do it. You know, because I can't talk. This is what we like all the time. Yeah, I can't talk when I'm uh, running the bus. Um, okay, <laughs> stop doing that. Right. <clears throat> okay, welcome uh, to part two. Um, obviously, we're still with Ben Herman Jones. Um, uh, the second part, we're going to be discussing more uh, paranormal. Yeah. Uh, hey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and focusing a lot on Helen Duncan as well. Mm-hmm. So um, over to, to Ben and, and to, uh, first of all just a brief overview of, of the paranormal, the world of paranormal and, and mm-hmm. how it relates to Helen Duncan. Well certainly well the paranormal is a difficult word to yeah, define. Yeah. It, and so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. hard to pronounce, yes. Yeah. But it from my primarily means things that um, can't really be will have no explanation currently mm-hmm. in the scientific mm-hmm. world. There's no currently any scientific um, Conclusion that actually yeah. defines these things as how they work, how the functioning of them. Now, um, the, obviously, the what we call paranormal changes over time. So, for example, there was a time when lightning was paranormal, mm-hmm. yeah. and no one yeah. knew how they how lightning worked. Now we know it's electrical discharge. Mm-hmm. There was a time when it was thought that um, several creatures, such as bats, and um, some sea creatures, such as mm-hmm. dolphins and whales, had some kind of supernatural ability to find their way around and to detect mm-hmm. things. Now we know they do it by sound waves. Mm-hmm. So the paranormal essentially is something that we can't yet explain, but might be able to explain in the future. And it very often changes because we explain one thing and other things appear. Mm. And what you include in the paranormal is um, some things such as ghosts um, and um, telepathy, mm. psychic powers, precognition, mediumship. Mm-hmm. Um, precognition, mean the ability to sense things that haven't happened yet, extrasensory perception, the ability yeah, yeah. to see things without <clears throat> you, or, or gain knowledge without your existing senses to gain knowledge that way. Um, mm. Mediumship is this very, very strange ability to some people on her mm. to communicate with the individuals who've died, yeah, yeah, which shouldn't be possible, and according to our current model of the, the definition of life and death, mm-hmm. and also. Um, Sometimes there are people who have encounters with uh, beings that are not of this world, and n- not been alive ever as human beings, mm. but appear to be some kind of spirit entity that exists. And this is where it overlaps very much with ufology. Yeah. There's a big overlap between <clears throat> that and yeah. ufology. Because, um, and I, I don't mind, I don't think I don't have a problem with that. I mean, very often people don't classify UFOs as paranormal, although it's very often people who, are, who have interest in one have interest in the yeah, other, like mm-hmm. myself. Mm-hmm. But um, you want to talk about Helen Duncan. Now, this is, yeah. a very, this is one of the most mm. interesting paranormal mm. stories of all. Mm-hmm. It's also a remarkable real-life courtroom drama. Yeah. And it combines the paranormal with government cover-ups, which essentially is why I'm so interested in mm-hmm. it. It also is a, an act of injustice that was done to somebody, which I feel uncomfortable with. I would like to see write it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Helen Duncan was born in 1898 in Calendar in Perthshire, Scotland. And from the very youngest age, it was very, very clear that she had very, very amazing abilities. Mm. She used to terrify her classmates because she used to sometimes start going into a trance. She'd go into like, yeah. a, a mediumship trance and start yelling all kinds of strange things at them. Um, but she, uh, she was called Hellish Nell, also a nickname when she was young. But um, this wasn't to do with her ability so much as her personality. She, she was quite a, a fiery, bad-tempered mm. young woman. But she was, she was also very loving and kind to, to people who were good to her. And she was very useful. For, for instance, when she was a young girl, there was a man in the local area where she lived who went missing. He, he, he got lost. And he was, this was during a time when, during a, a very, very severe winter when there was a mm. blizzard and cold, freezing cold temperatures. And she led the search party to go and find him using techniques we would today call remote viewing, mm. extrasensory perception. And she, yeah. found <clears throat> and she found him before he froze to death. He'd probably have died if it hadn't been for her. Mm. She saved his life. Um, mm. Now, what she did was, when she grew up, she actually started performing professionally as a psychic medium. Yeah. yeah. So she was like the equivalent of Colin Fry or Gordon, 
what's his name? The the the, the psychic guy you see on TV, you know. Um, she was she was um, doing that, and she has been criticised a lot for that. But I said, well, why not? There's no problem. I mean, she, she, what she's doing is real. Yeah. Why shouldn't yeah. she? Why shouldn't she do it professionally? Yeah. And people came from all over the world to see her. She was very very famous, and she was one of these people called manifestation mediums. So what she, she when she went into a trance, she would actually produce images, physical forms, in what's called ectoplasm. She would bring this substance. This substance would come out of her, out of her body, usually out of her mouth or nose. It would form into shapes, and these shapes would, would sometimes resemble spirits, the, the people who died. The spirits would form into the shape of the people who died. It's incredible, isn't it? It's yeah, incredible. it is amazing. <laughs> but she got into big trouble. I mean, there's a, I mean, I know we have we've limited time, so I can't tell the full story, but she, she got into terrible trouble with several people, several sceptics, who were mm. trying to prove her f wrong. <clears throat> and they didn't succeed, in my view. Mm -hmm. But... Um, the real trouble of her began in 1941. Mm. Now, this is during World War II was underway, and when well, I mean, we look back at it now, we know what happened. You know, it's, from our position in Britain, it ended happily. Mm. You know, from what? Well, that's a big subject. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, we can't go into that, but it, it, from the point of view of a mainstream British mm. position, we, yeah. we won. Everything was great. But um, the uh, to be in the middle of it and not know what's going to happen, not know, mm. it's very, very frightening. Especially mm. this just after Dunkirk and we had yeah, the blitz yeah. and yeah. people, there were people were dying in the foreign fields and we had like people dying at home when the houses were bombed. Mm. People mm. were going to the shelters when the air raid siren went off. But H Helen was in great demand. Now she went to this place called the Master Temple, which is in Portsmouth. It's, um, it's amazing. I've been there. It's just someone's flat now, but I did go there and it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and she, her spirit guide came forward, a guy called Albert, who was an Australian, who, who died around the turn of the 20th century. And he said, I'm very soft, sorry to have to tell you, a British battleship has just been sunk. I have 1,400 of our officers and men with me now, newly arrived in the spirit world. And everyone was gobsmacked, what? We, there'd been nothing in the news about a British battleship being sunk. And faithfully, one of the people in the audience was a guy called Brigadier Roy Firebrace, who was head of army intelligence, but also... He was, a, he was a spiritualist, he was a psychic investigator, he was a member of the psychic Society of Psychic Research. And so he phoned up the Admiralty on the, on the, on the crypt, encrypted line, the scrambler phone, and he says, mm. hey, what's going on? Um, I've just heard a story about a ship that's been sunk. I've not seen any of the papers about it. And I said, oh no, nothing, there's nothing to worry about, sir, nothing. But then this, the same person phoned him back and said, actually, funny enough, we just lost HMS Hood. But she was sunk off Scapa Flow in the North Sea hit by a torpedo from a U-boat. And um, but the thing is this hadn't been reported in the media. Mm -hmm. And Firebrace had to go directly to the Admiralty on a cryptic line which only he had access to to get that information. Mm -hmm. And apparently it happened just before Helen began her seance because mm -hmm. the ship had sunk. And you can imagine, I mean we know he was concerned because there's a letter which his daughter has, his daughter's mm -hmm. still alive, where he he writes to the the government, he writes to the War Office, specifically recommending that they keep an eye on Helen Duncan. Because, I mean, he understood, he would have understood the implications of this immediately. Mm -hmm. you know, because, um, essentially, I mean, this was not classified, but it could have been. This could have been classified information. And she may, it's possible she might give out classified information through the testimony of the dead. I mean, you often hear in these films, these yeah. spy thrillers, you know, we have to kill him because he knew too much. Mm -hmm. But what do you do if you can't silence mm -hmm. someone even by killing them? Yeah, yeah. It was a situ really a situation. Could Firebrace made sure that I mean we don't know specifically if she was watched, but I bet she was. But she was probably watched by the enemy as well. Yeah. And they knew yeah. that, and they were waiting for something to come through. Now, in, in um, later in the year, she was back in the Master Temple, and another ship was sunk. This is HMS Barham this time. This is a now it can be told story. 4:25 in the Mediterranean on the afternoon of November the 25th, 1941. A salvo of torpedoes fired at close range struck HMS Barham. The stricken battleship heeled over to port. Within four minutes of being hit, her after magazine blew up. A, another Admiralty class battle cruiser, one of the most powerful ships the Royal Navy possessed. And because morale was very low at that time, mm. the government decided to keep it secret. Even some of the relatives were not informed immediately. But Helen Duncan, in her, yeah, she was in her seance at the Master Temple. Albert came forward, I'm sorry, another British battleship has been sunk. I have 400 of our officers and men here, newly arrived in the spirit world. 
And one of them came forward in ectoplasm. He was a young man, who, and he was in his navy uniform, his square rig, with, and his mother was in the audience and recognised him. She had no idea that he was dead. <sighs> she hadn't been told. I mean, this was literally just very soon afterwards, but I mean, they, the government suppressed it. And they, now, they must have been really worried by this because yeah. they kept this quiet. Um, now, in 1944, that's when all trouble hell broke loose, because in January 1944, she was arrested. She was back at the Martha Temple in Portsmouth, mm. and there was a police raid during the, um, during the seance, and she was, was arrested, everyone was detained, um, all kinds of things, and she was dragged off. And she was expecting, it because they had, the fraud, they had the Vagrancy Act in those days, which meant that you know, fake mediums were very often fined. Mm. And she thought, well, that's all right, I'll just get another 10 shilling fine and let's go back to what I was doing before. I'm more, I earn more than that in, in, mm. in an hour, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but this was, this was escalated to a, to a level that she couldn't possibly have comprehended. She found herself in the Old Bailey, in the Central Criminal Court of London, being charged under the Witchcraft Act of mm. 1735. <laughs> this is a very archaic law. The only mm. reason it was still on the statute books was because they couldn't be bothered to get enough MPs together to officially repeal it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just basically saying that those who imitate, the, I can't remember the actual text, those who imitate the conjuration spirits and other cunning folk, other cunning things, and it's basically to, it was to for dealing with fake mediums. If she was found guilty, she'd get up to nine months in jail. It's a massive, I mean, she was in far worse trouble than mm. she'd ever been before. Mm. And it was, it, was, it was very, very clear that this was actually some kind of kangaroo court. Yeah. <clears throat> for example, um, the, the prosecution, the, the government chose, the Crown chose its prosecution barrister, a guy called John Cyril Maud KC. Now he was already conducting a case in another courtroom, so he had to sort of like jump between the two, and his assistant carried on a lot of the case. But why get him involved? Why this guy who was already involved in another case anyway, mm. why get him to split his time between the two cases? And the reason is, Maud had two jobs. Like mo most people in the war had two jobs. They would have their normal job and they would have their wartime job. Mm -hmm. And Maud's wartime job was to be head of Section B-19 at MI5. Mm. Now, B-19 was a wartime human intelligence network, which was, would, they'd be basically tracking the sources of rumours. It's exactly the unit that the government would deploy if they were watching Helen Duncan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I reckon that P. He, Maud was probably watching Helen Duncan as his role as an intelligence officer, and he just swapped hats or put on his wig and prosecuted her as, as a prosecution barrister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was, there was several other people involved. There was, a, there was a guy called Commander Ian Fleming. And he was head of naval, he was head of naval intelligence. He, was, he spied on the Moscow Shell trials. Mm -hmm. He spied on the, on the Spanish Civil War. Um, you may be familiar with the name Ian Fleming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He yeah. also created the character James Bond, mm -hmm. which of course has spawned a very serious, yeah, successful yeah. series of films. Um, but he was in, he was, seems to be the linchpin in this, he was running things behind the scenes as a chap uh, who's discovered that, a uh, researcher has discovered that, called William Hartley. Now, um, what they did was this, the, the police raid was organised by someone called um, Lieutenant Stanley Worth, mm -hmm. who was a, he was in the Royal Navy, but he was also a special constable in the police, <coughs> he was uh, he was head of um, the Royal Navy's Provost Special Investigation Division. Someone that he was an intelligence officer too. He lied in court when they asked him, and he, he so he could have been, he should have been prosecuted for perjury, but he was never prosecuted. But he was he was probably working with Maud and with Fleming and these other people to watch Helen Duncan, and he says he just come up with this absolutely cock and bull story. He said, "Oh, I just went along to seances for fun. <laughs> I went with my my mates. It was like a lad's night out. Instead of going down the pub or something, we go to, we go to watch the spooks. <laughs> we go we go to see a, a psychic medium perform." And it was, it was amazing, it was quick because it was expensive, 12 shillings it cost to get in, which was a lot of money in those mm. days. So it was an expensive hobby he and his friends had. <laughs> and he said, but when he saw her, and he, and he said, he went to one of those seances, and he saw this big fat Scottish woman prancing around covered in a bed sheet. <laughs> he said, I'm going to bring her to justice. And so he organised this police raid with this guy called Chief Constable Arthur West, who was head of Portsmouth Police, and who, funnily enough, was involved in the case in the other courtroom being run by Maud, in court number one. He was... Maud was defending a man accused of murder mm -hmm. in Portsmouth, and in court number four he was prosecuting Helen Duncan. Funnily enough, um, the man accused of murder in court one was acquitted, and the, the prime prosecution witness was Chief Constable Arthur West, 
and the man accused West of trying to frame him. <laughs> this is very interesting. Um, so, it's, it's all very, very dodgy. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny thing is, what, what, Ward, what uh, Worth did, Stanley Worth and his friend Rupert Cross, who was also a police officer, they basically organised a raid and they went into the, into the sales room and they said at the crucial time they would grab the bed sheet and they would call the police and they'd blow whistles and the police, the police were all just hiding outside the door and they came storming in. <laughs> well, the thing is, they did, they, st they stood up, according to the court transcripts, they stood up, they grabbed the bed sheet, they, they switched, the police were in the room in a matter of moments. The lights went on. And so, where, where was the bed sheet? That's the question, because they mm -hmm. both had their hands on this bed sheet. This is a king size bed sheet. I mean, you see photos of Helen Duncan. She's no ballerina. Mm. She's a large lady. Needs a big white sheet to cover her. They apparently had their hands on this bed sheet, but then the bed sheet was nowhere to be found, which is a bit odd. Mm. Well, they lost it. <laughs> I mean, this should have been a vital court exhibit, an essential piece of evidence, and they lost it. Mm -hmm. And so the um, Charles Lowesby, the defence barrister, he. He grilled him on this. And where was it? Oh, someone must have hidden it. We sort of lost it in the in the fuss. And I thought, how can you possibly lose something like this? Mm. A bed sheet, like a six foot square sheet of cloth, mm. in a chaos of a police raid, with the lights on in the room. I mean, it just there was no bed sheet. Mm. It was. Mm. But unfortunately, it went on like this. Now the the prosecution witnesses were coached by a guy called Harry Price, who was a one of these investigators who tried to denounce Helen in 1930 because she. She'd done a study with Price in London in 1930, and, yes, was, yeah. and there were all kinds of reasons why Price lied about that. Mm -hmm. So he comes back into her life 14 years later to try and put her away in jail, mm -hmm. and he coached the prosecution witnesses. And now the defence witnesses said they saw a real seance, the, the led by Worth, said that they just saw um, some um, fat old lady prancing around in a bedsheet. But fortunately, Lowsby didn't do enough to defend Helen in this part of the mm -hmm. trial, because he had a plan. What he wanted to do was, he would wait until the next part of the trial, and he would say, he would get Helen Duncan to perform a seance in court. <laughs> and he did say, he said, uh, let, us, let her perform a seance right here, why not? All she requires is a curtain off a cubicle and red light. She's willing to do this. And so he petitioned the judge to allow Helen Duncan to perform a seance in court to prove she was real. Which would have been incredible, if that had happened. Mm -hmm. It would have been incredible, the judge said no way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, those people protested, and mm. he agreed to poll the jury, and the jury elected not to, apparently, which is what? WTF? What? Mm. If you were on that jury, just for the sake of your own curiosity, it's, would you really mm. vote no? Mm. Mm. Exactly. It's, yeah. it, this is one of the unique opportunities. Mm. It would be history being made. <laughs> but, um, and so that was it. And unfortunately, after that, the defence case fell apart because those people. Lowsby was really hanging his hopes on this, mm. and so was Helen. Mm. Um, and then she, West was the prosecution witness, of course, but he was also, he gave her a character assessment. It was damning, he said. Mm. She's a heartless exploiter of the grief-stricken and vulnerable. <sighs> and so the judge, Charles Dodson, who was the recorder of London, he was the head judge at the Old Bailey, he had no option but to give her the full nine months in Holloway Prison. And so her poor Helen Duncan, she... Uh, so she served that term, it's just... She served... Yeah, she, she, she did not quite nine months because she was held on remand, so mm. she got some time off because of that. Mm. And it's kind of a double time situation, so yeah, she was held yeah. on remand like a month, so she got like two months off. Mm -hmm. But she wasn't released until September. Yet on June 6th, 1944, there was a mass invasion of Normandy, France, of Operation Overlord, mm. which we would come to know as D-Day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, this is why I think they put Helen away. In November 1943, mm. there was a disaster. Because um, the thing about D-Day was planned a long way in advance, and a lot of people knew about it, and there was a lot of disinformation to try and fool the enemy into thinking mm. that it wasn't going to happen, that the Allies were going to invade through Italy. And Fleming himself was involved in this, planting fake documents on bodies and things like that for the enemy to find. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, but just imagine, what happened in, in November? There was um, a training session, because they, they actually built a fake village in in Dorset, to, and you can visit today, it's a museum piece, mm -hmm. just to, for, for, the, for the training for D-Day. One of these landing craft, you know the type with the ramp at the front, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, was, it was exercising off the coast, loaded down with troops, it sank. Everyone on board drowned. 
So there's about 100 people like floating around in the spirit world with, who knew the secrets of d mm -hmm. just waiting for Helen Duncan to <laughs> come I mean, I don't, I don't know why they would say things that were classified, but you, who knows? I mean, they don't think like we do, the spirits. But the government thought, my God, should one of these guys needs to come forward in the audience and say something about D-Day, and then just one enemy agent in the audience needs to be there, and it's mm -hmm. all blown. Yeah. 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 We need to get Helen Duncan put away. We need to put her somewhere where she can't practice. Mm -hmm. Just until this is all over, and I think this is why they concocted this false case against her. And it's very, very sad. I mean, Helen, Helen came out of prison, mm -hmm. but she was very bitter about the whole thing. She was very angry that she'd not been allowed to perform in the court. Mm -hmm. She never really got over it. She went back to practicing mediumship. In 1956, she was in in your neck of the woods, West Bridgeford, south of Nottingham. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was at the Spiritualist Church there, which is a room in someone's house. I went there too, but the people there, the people there were really mm -hmm. like, hostile. No, there's no way they would let me film in there. Now. I mean, they, would, they really didn't want to. No. So even after all these years, it's still really, really you know, people are really worried about it. Because what happened was there was another police raid, and this time Helen was really badly injured. Um, if you disturb a medium in trance when they were exuding ectoplasm, mm. manifestation medium, it can cause them great injury. Mm -hmm. In Helen's case, she got secondary second degree burns right down the front of her body. Um, and she wasn't taken to the hospital, the police were like really re detaining her and everything like that, it was really awful. And then, and then um, she went back to recover, this was in November of 1956 mm. this happened, mm -hmm. she went back to recover in her home in, in Perthshire, Scotland, but a, a few weeks later she died. Was it from the injuries? From, mm. from it's a, it was put, not put on the death certificate. <coughs> she was not a well lady. She, mm. she was, had health problems her whole mm. life. But there's no doubt that this exacerbated her existing yeah, yeah, poor health. Contributed, and, yeah. Yeah, contributed to mm. her death, I, I believe. Uh, but she's been in touch ever since, apparently. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Much <laughs> mm. <clears throat> as an example mm. of the way this relationship between the paranormal and, and warfare. And it's, it's not new. I mean, it's, it's, it's not unprecedented. For mm. example, Alexander the Great used to consult a soothsayer before going into battle. Oh, yeah. And Julius yeah, Caesar yeah. had his own yeah. personal soothsayer. Mm. Went, a soothsayer <clears throat> was the equivalent in those days yeah. of a medium, yeah. who used to accompany him on his campaigns and advise him. And, um, well, th there's the famous story of, in France of the, the young peasant girl, 14-year-old Jeanne Roumet. The king put her in charge of the French army oh. because he believed she was getting divine inspiration. And thanks to her, this just young girl who knew nothing about the, <laughs> the military, the French still managed to kick the English at the, the siege of Orléans. <laughs> and of course the English unfortunately captured her and burnt her at the stake. Yeah, was, we yeah. know the, the story of Joan of Arc mm. very well. Mm. Mm -hmm. And during the Cold War, there was a, both sides used remote viewing techniques mm. in, on, against the other. There's a guy called Ingo Swan who's written about this. Um, and Uri Geller, the famous... Yeah former who's well, basically he's, he, he I think he's when he's performing he doesn't use real <coughs> psychic powers yeah, yeah, I think he's just yeah. a fraud but he was recruited by Mossad and the CIA yes, that, yeah. now this that, is yeah, yeah. he was tested at the Stanford <coughs> Research Institute in 1972 by some, two guys Russell Targan Hal Putoff and they said he was real and then everything goes a bit strange because then he becomes like a a pop celebrity mm. psychic and just doing these tricks which the sceptics can pick apart. But on the other hand, he, he admitted in 2013 that he, all this time he'd been working for the CIA in Mossad. Mm. And what's more, he'd spied on the Arab-Israeli Arab yeah, war yeah. and the Six Day War, stuff like that. And, he, and he, he'd been used to do all kinds of remote viewing operations. Mm. Uh, I remember mm. seeing a do documentary, I think Andrew pulled up as well, a documentary when he was with Edgar Mitchell. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, Gallo was Yuri Gallo. I think on that program admitted that he'd been working for the CIA then. Yeah, okay. <coughs> and and that's it, that's yeah. because yeah. Um, Andrew Andrews talked about this in his interview. Yeah, yeah. That um, Edgar Mitchell, well, what his, his one of his family members, his mm. son, I believe, inadvertently sort of confessed that the family were involved with the CIA. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, <laughs> secretly recorded. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, on the Bart Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever that means, but yeah. Sabral makes a joke out of it. Really. But it's very plain what he means, very yeah. clear. Cool CIA. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. This is when they believed they were talking in private. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Do you want to get a gun and shoot them at them before they get out of the office? <laughs> we have a video camera running if you want to do it. All right. All right. All right. That would be great footage for us. See you later. In court, I hope. You want to call the CIA? Have them whacked. But isn't that, um, isn't that odd? I mean, that there's this connection with these various people. Yes, and, yeah. Um, Geller, with the fact that he was so successful as a celebrity, when, mm. when I mean, a lot of magicians got angry with him. I mean, it's not just a skeptic, it's because he was basically just, he only had about three tricks. Mm -hmm. And they were just like the, the bending of the spoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, yeah. And a couple of others. I mean, but this, yeah. but there's loads of magicians who do much better tricks yeah. than that. And I said, well, why is this guy so famous? <laughs> why is he so successful? And the answer could be that he was just simply. He was some Emotive shamming. He yeah. was shamming the whole thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. and saving his real talents <clears throat> for his yeah. secret work yes. with the government. Yeah, yeah. You know, and um, Ingo Swan, his book is he's, he's died now, unfortunately. Ingo Swan, but he was he was recruited by the CIA, <clears throat> and he did remote viewing and things like mm. that. And paid handsomely for it, <laughs> and then afterwards he he got involved in freelance work. Another guy is Ed Dames. That's another one. He's quite oh, famous. Yeah, yeah. He's a like remote viewing course courses and he can teach people how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, he was also involved in several government projects. Um, so, I mean, a massive amount of resources has been spent in, <coughs> on developing this mm. uh, system which supposedly doesn't exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you ask a, for a public <coughs> statement from the government, they will just send back saying, we don't know what you're talking about, this yeah. is nonsense. <laughs> yeah. And the need on the media, it's, it's, again, it's treated as a novelty. Yeah. Yeah. Of course it's the plot and <coughs> that is the supernatural, of course, is a plot of lots of different horror horror movies. In fact, mm. it's a staple of the horror movie yeah, yeah, genre. It is, yeah. uh, it's either like the supernatural horror or sci-fi mm. horror. You know, those are the general two sides of the horror genre. But I mean, people just watch that and think well, it's just fictional. You know? mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. part of the cool rock into as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, <clears throat> it's quite scary to contemplate this. But yeah. mm. there are several horror movies that are based on true stories. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, very yeah. often they are. They are sexed up from the cinema, yeah. but they are still very, very really mm. done. I mean, there was um, mm. this really horrific, terrifying film called *The Serpent and the Rainbow*, which is about voodoo, oh, um, which is really, really scary. Mm -hmm. But it's based on a study by a guy called Wade Davis, who was looking into the zombie phenomenon. Uh, it's, <laughs> I know it's, it's you've got to reassure yourself by looking at the factual mm. side of it after you've watched the movie, because you mm. think this is real. <laughs> it's, it's terrifying. Mm -hmm. awesome. What was your what's your thoughts on zombies? I know that I mean films, very popular. Mm -hmm. Zombie mm -hmm. films are this ten to a penny, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. and the, I've done an entire presentation on this. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I know we don't have much time left. Yeah, but yeah, in yeah. a nutshell, there's several different <laughs> things associated with zombies. I mean, zombies go back a long way. They originate in in Africa, mm. where the 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 sorcerer, the dark shaman, would possess would reanimate the body of a mm. of a dead person a corpse and basically use it as a, a mindless slave or mm. would yeah. obey or stress using various mm. spells and of course this is mm. absolute staple for horror movies mm. and, i mean the the classic ones of course are the george a romero movies yeah which, are, which is where you get the idea of the zombie which attacks living people and mm. eats them, eats them yeah, if yeah. you survive an attack you become a zombie yeah. and things like that yeah. But now, what the funny thing is, though, that is, is this you've been used as an allegory for something real? I mean, we have like a really weird situation where a Freedom of Information Act request was, was done by the Guardian newspaper. And this is really interesting because they treat it as a joke, but mm. of course, when they, when they contacted Bristol City Council, it turns out that Bristol City Council has a zombie preparedness plan. And it's done in all seriousness, all seriousness. <laughs> and the, the, when they wrote back, they couldn't believe how, what, when the council wrote back what they said. There was a team that are regularly trained in zombie handling techniques. There were different levels of alert. You know, there's a alert status four, five, four, three, two, one. Zombie and zombie pandemic level is on, is one. And I thought everyone thought it was maybe just like a Christmas joke. They, they, mm -hmm. Then because disaster preparedness can't be running cheerful thing to be involved in, you need to lay your hair down. But it turns out this is actually completely and utterly serious. Not only and the the government was spending you know council taxpayers' money on this yeah, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah. The, the, the local the local Crazy. governments in yeah. Bristol, the local authorities, yeah, the yeah. council. And and 
there was some idea that this may be used as an as an allegory for mm. something else. Maybe it's code. Yeah. Maybe it's code for say civil unrest. Mm. Yeah. And they just didn't want they didn't and they were just using zombies as kind of an allegorical code to hide what they were doing. Mm. But it turns out there are several details involved in the in the document which seem to be pretty specific to the zombie <laughs> phenomenon. I'm like, what's going on? And then I find out that the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States of America also has has a zombie preparedness thing. And this is really weird because there's this um there's Rear Admiral Ali Khan, who is the head of in, he's the head of um, disaster preparedness at the CDC, mm-hmm. and he has a blog where he was writing about what would happen if there was a zombie outbreak. That's right, a <laughs> zombie outbreak. And he wow. said, "What would you do?" This is like part. He was. He said, "What would you do?" Um, and he goes into several details. And at the end of this, almost as an afterthought, he says, "And also prepare for other things such as, um, you know, a, a tornado or a or a terrorist attack or something mm-hmm. like that." Mm-hmm. And I thought, and I thought, again, maybe he's using code for something, you know, but then, because for, 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 like, problems with diseases, but then they, they come, they, several specific details related to zombies comes out in this document. Mm-hmm. For example, there's zombie killing techniques, and again, it's, it's the same thing you see in the horror movies, like with, in the Romero films, mm-hmm. they say, severing the head, <clears throat> or destroying the, bla- the brain through blunt trauma, or gunshot. And of course, this is what you get in the Romero films. You've got to whack them hard over the head mm-hmm. with, with an instrument or shoot them in the head. And that's the only way to kill a zombie or to, to make it properly dead. And um, I just thought this is, uh, you know, what it doesn't make sense that they would put these details mm-hmm. in. And then there was this other disaster preparedness document that came out of the, de- of the Department of Homeland <coughs> Security mm-hmm. that talked about very, very distinct details to do with zombies. For example, different kinds of zombies. There were the... Um, there were, the, there were the traditional zombies, which they called evil magic zombies. Mm-hmm. This is a serious government document Crazy, which, in which yeah. the police <clears throat> and the, the, the Centre for Disease Control, FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, and, and the military are trained mm. in. <clears throat> a serious document. Um, evil magic zombies, the traditional kind, animated through uh, evil, you know, black magic. There were the um, radiation zombies, which are created by radiation from space. Um, the chicken zombies are quite funny. They're, they're farmyard poultry that have been reanimated. And the, there was a really funny one is vegetarian zombies. <laughs> Believe it or not. But these are zombies which are, it's a, they're no direct threat to human life, but they, they, can inadver- they can indirectly affect human life because they gobble up farm produce in vast numbers. So they'll, they'll like eat crops in fields and things like that. They're not like locusts. They're not dangerous in themselves, but if they attack, the results could be, could be devastating because there'd be famine. <laughs> oh. mm. I laughed when I read this, mm. but I mean, there's some documents. There's there's a whole page on on um, the the legal implications of of killing zombies about how you discern real people from you know living people from zombies. And indeed, in the, in the film Night of the Living Dead, at the end, you remember the the main character he oh, gets yeah. killed. <clears throat> he gets yeah. killed by the man who thinks he's a zombie. Mm-hmm. Um, so they go through that. There's a long li- list of legal documents related to this, and I thought. If this is some sort of if this is some sort of code, they're using, if this is some kind of they're preparing for civil unrest or a, a, a disease pandemic mm. or some kind of major natural disaster like an earthquake or a tornado, etc. If they're doing this, and then they they bring in details like this, it just doesn't make sense. Mm. It, it could only yeah, make yes. if they are actually preparing some real zombie outbreaks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just thought, what is going on? <laughs> It's a bit crazy, isn't it? Mm. And I still, I'm, I did a whole presentation on this, and I still haven't come to to, to a definitive conclusion. I must say, mm. but it just, it's just—it's uh, pretty scary. Mm. There's a presentation on YouTube. Yes. Bit, oh, yeah. well, you can watch it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, there are yeah. several different versions. Most <coughs> recent one is the 2015 one, which is the best, I think. Mm. Okay. We'll put that in. That's the studio version. Yeah. That, yeah. mm-hmm. That's the studio version. But so, um, since I did that, I've not actually done that presentation mm. since. But I do. Maybe there'll be an update, and I'll. I'll do it again if I find out exactly what the hell's going on. Exactly. Um, just the, um, what are your? That's quite a general question. Really. Your perception, perception on on ghosts and the phenomenon surrounding ghosts, because mm. it's quite a broad, it's quite a broad yes. thing. Yes. Mm-hmm. <coughs> well, what they are, I mean, it's hard to say because it's yeah. possible what we call ghosts might be more than one phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which we have generically categorised um, incorrectly mm. as a single phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. Some of them, I mean, they could be. Do you, sort of things that 
you know, like big clouds. Some of them are big mm. clouds of vapour that just appear. Some are literally people who yeah. actually look yeah. like normal people. <clears throat> so you might have an encounter with somebody mm. who looks completely normal. You talk to them, they act completely normal. You go home and you find they died a couple of days mm. ago. That's mm -hmm. an example of a ghost mm -hmm. encounter. There's, this, there's the stone tape type ghost. It's called stone tape. I mean, that, that's just like a, a descriptive set, mm. which is, appears to be where you you see um, a vision of the past. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's not, it's not necessarily you're seeing a ghost. You, it may be some sort of like a time shift type experience. Right, yeah. Um, what ghosts, what I think some ghosts are, are essentially... They're essentially bleed over some other worlds because yeah. our universe is not the only one. Yeah, and you can yeah. travel in space. I mean, this is what I saw. You see, when I was in 1996, I woke up very suddenly from a deep sleep, hmm. and there was a little boy kneeling on the floor of my bedroom, oh. mm -hmm. and he lifted up into the air, and and he funny thing was he wasn't solid. He was like. So he was like trans translucent. Yeah. He appeared to be made of smoke. He was a smoke, like cigarette smoke or something, to keep mm. in shape. Mm -hmm. He looked like that. And he, I looked at him, he lifted, he was like kneeling on the floor, he was wearing some kind of nightgown, he had his hands like that as if he was praying. Oh. And he lifted up into the air as I looked at him, and he drifted away into the corner of the room, and he turned and looked at me, and our eyes met, and it was like really weird. And I thought, what the hell was that? Oh. And it's possible that he was from another universe, mm. which somehow had, m had blended in with our yeah. own, and there'd yeah. been some kind of bleed over, there'd mm. been some connection with our own. Mm. And I'm very interested in to see, now they've got the, the, the Large Hadron Collider running yeah. in, in CERN, mm. whether that one of the offshoots of that will be, um, we see more ghosts. Mm. Because one of the things that the LHC does, and it's, it's powerful enough to break through the, the, the planes between the gaps, the walls between different parallel universes wow. yeah. because I mean, our universe is not the only one yeah, I mean, like I said yeah. it's, it can go beyond length breadth and height mm. into higher dimensions and you come across another universe yeah. which may be similar to our own it may be almost exactly the same apart from there's one grain of sand out of place you mm. know? or it might be totally different mm. Mm -hmm. and it's possible that sometimes if these merge if there's some kind of contact between the two we perceive them as we see that there's something weird, just something weird appears then. Yeah. We suddenly perceive yeah. something really weird, and we go, oh my god, what's that? It's a ghost. Yeah. Alternatively, ghosts, what ghosts could be, is they, they could literally be uh, manifestations of spirits of the dead. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the people, when, when people have these ghost encounters, very often it is with someone they know, mm. someone they're close to, <clears throat> who has recently died. Mm. And sometimes they know this person has died, and sometimes they don't. But now, of course, uh, skeptics will put this down to uh, wishful thinking if you're, in, 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 you're mm. feeling gr grief. Yeah. But it doesn't, that doesn't, because in a sense you hallucinate, mm. because you just lost someone you love and you're very upset, so you hallucinate their appearance. If that was the case, loads of people would be. Exactly, yeah. <coughs> yeah. And what's more, also, you wouldn't get like multiple sightings of the yeah. same entity. Yeah. yeah. Things like that, <coughs> uh, which sometimes happens. Or you, get two, or you get two people who perceive the same thing at the same time. This actually happened to my dad and my brother when my mum died. Mm. They both had an encounter with her at the same time in different places. Right. Very interesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. So, um, there's many, many examples like that which make many, many reasons that I do <coughs> doubt the hallucination theory and things mm. like that. And it's possible the spirits, sometimes the spirits bring comfort and they just, yeah, yeah. <coughs> they want to, in a sense, it's a, it's a way of saying goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. And also to reassure their loved one that they haven't just vanished yeah. and they disappeared, which is the mm. conventional view of death, where we just cease to exist. Alternatively, if the, if the family's very religious, they want to reassure them they're not burning in hell <laughs> because they didn't put enough money in the collection plate, whatever it is. You know, things like that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one... There's all kinds of um, very, very interesting things associated with that. Yeah, so part yeah. of the ghost phenomenon, I think, is that. And I mean, yeah. they, there's other things such as they they interact with electronics quite easily. You get like yeah. the electronic <clears throat> voice phenomenon. Don, it's Don electronic, Phillips, it's electric energy. Along, yeah. along mm -hmm. the go, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Don Phillips, who lives in Leicester, yeah, yeah. he's near you. <clears throat> he he talks a lot about this. Mm -hmm. so it's just they can influence electrical yeah, equipment. Yeah. You get like voices on tapes and mm. and televisions. You get like the white the, the film white noise. White noise, like, yeah, yeah. Images yeah. appear on TV screens. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a very interesting case where a, a woman whose son died. Mm. And you can see his his face appears on the TV screen, and uh, and um, it, it, there's a there was a women's magazine that did a piece on this, 
And you could quite clearly see the out. It's not the actual face, but it's the outline mm. of the face on the TV screen. Just white mm. lines on the outline. It's very clearly her son. Mm. And it appeared on the television, and even when the television was unplugged, this, this image still appeared, and it was captured on camera. Right. And could it be like, uh, with the electric energy, they're using like our electric devices to gain more strength, to, mm. to, to come through more yeah. mm -hmm. positive, you know? It's, it seems, they, they seem to really interact with, yeah. uh, it's a way of communication yeah. in our world, yeah. yeah, with the world we're living. Yeah. I mean, I, I myself had an encounter with a, an entity on a train in 2008. Mm. I, um... I just started dating Sue Stain, this lady who lived in Bingham, who I, mm. I had a relationship with for eight years. Mm. And um, just soon after we started dating, I was on my way back on the train to Oxford after visiting her. It was dark, it was mm. November time, and it was dark outside. You know, if you're on a train and it's dark, the, the windows act as a kind of mirror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was sort of sitting there drifting off to sleep and looking at the... So you, I had the reflection of the inside <coughs> of the cabin ahead of me, and then... I noticed there was a man standing on the, in the aisle of the train staring at me. I could, I could see him directly ahead of me as, as a reflection. And in the, my peripheral vision, I could actually see him it, when I was in this sort of half-sleep state. And um, I don't know how long the time lasts, but because I was in this sort of strange state of consciousness. Mm. And I suddenly <clears> snapped <throat> awake and he was gone. But I, I remember he looked like he was a middle-aged man, thin hair. And he was mm. wearing a white jacket, like a bar steward's jacket. Mm. <laughs> And I went and told Sue this next time I saw her, and she, she gasped. She said, oh, my goodness. She went and got a photograph and showed this photograph of a man with, who looked very much like the man I saw on the train, mm. including the bar steward's jacket. He was standing behind the bar. He says, is that him? And I said, it looks a bit like him. Could be. Can't be certain. Mm. But, you know, my eyes were slightly blurred, but it does look like him. And she said, uh, that's my dad, and he died in 1988. It was one of those thunderclap moments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, I, not, I must stress, I had not seen that photograph. Mm, no. I didn't mm. know before. I mm. didn't know what her father looked like. But, so I, had, I would not have... Because if I had, then you could say I'd have hallucinated mm. him. Mm. Yeah. But I didn't. And it, which is indicates something. It indicates that he... If this, this is the spirit of her father, mm. then he... He has an awareness of, as a spirit of who mm. he was when he during his last corporeal lifetime. He knows who he was. He also has memories of who he, sort of memories of his mm. lifetime, mm -hmm. and an identity of who he is. And he has the ability to see into our world, the world that mm. he's left. Mm -hmm. And he's doing what any father would do. I think he's keeping an eye on his children, mm. his daughter, and he wants to know what kind of men are hanging around with him. <laughs> so he, he's following me around. I thought that's gone off. Comes off there. Oh, okay. <clears throat> that's all right though. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. He was following me around. Mm -hmm. He wanted to know what kind of man I was. Yeah. So this is very interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so, so, um, that's very, that's very interesting. Yes. Um, oh, yes, it's... But so that's, so that's a big encounter. With, so this is where I developed my interest mm -hmm. in the paranormal. A lot of people mm -hmm. again have paranormal experiences, like the UFO yeah. experiences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they don't like to talk about it openly. Yeah, that's right. Unless they're in a company, <clears throat> someone they know will take them seriously. Yeah. Because yeah. they've been conditioned. Not to, in yeah. a way, yeah. Because yeah. it is treated as a joke, isn't yes. it? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's, it's treated to, as a... It's got a breakthrough, like. As a farce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And so it is, it's, um, <clears throat> it's a difficult thing to to push back against mm. when there's all this media conditioning yeah. against it. Because I believe the government are covering up lots of, lot of other paranormal things, not just UFOs, they yeah, cover they, up oh, a lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because they don't want us to know these <clears throat> things, are real. I think they want us to... Because I think it belittles... Materialism, I think, is, in a sense... It's restricting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They want us to believe, you know, that, that life's a bitch and then mm. you die. Mm. Yeah. Or either that, or you can choose some off-the-shelf religion which says that you're, you know, that God, you're mighty powerful and all-punishing God decides what happens. <laughs> but either way, you know, with the help, either the helpless play things are random mm. chance, mm. and we have our three school years and ten, and we have come from nothing, we go back to nothing, mm. or we are the, we're at the mercy of some God who will. That's it. Mm. Sends to hell. It's like our choices are limited, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. You, know? you can choose one or the other. You can't <coughs> yeah, it's pretty you can clear, yeah, yeah. But the third option is not allowed. Mm. No. Yeah. It's like believe in God and live by this way, and then mm. you may be rewarded, mm. or you die nothing. Yeah. That's a choice, you know. These, choice. Yeah. These two things are set apart. <coughs> obviously, you see Richard yeah. Dawkins debating with some guy in a dog collar, you know. <laughs> and these two things are set as opposites. But as David Icke explains, they are opposites. Yet he coined this phrase opposites. Things mm. are seen as opposites. Mm. 
but they're not really. Yeah. And it's what Richard D. Hall calls it the phony bone of contention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a great phrase. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Probably his best. Yeah. yeah. Because both, <laughs> both sides will unite in yes. condemnation of people like yeah. us. Yeah. yeah. The, the atheosceptic materialist will say it's, it's delusionary nonsense and mm. pseudoscience. Mm. The religious believer will say it's mm. the work of the devil. You're dabbling with dark forces yeah. and, and, the, and the occult and things like that. But they'll both unite and stand shoulder to shoulder in condemnation yeah. of people like us. Exactly. Yeah. And what you find with the secret society network, the Illuminati, which I talked about last time, you know, they are they control these both these sides, both mm. these things. The the creation of the mainstream religions by the, the network mm -hmm. is very, very provable. It is provable. Yes, yeah, yeah. Especially with Christianity. <clears throat> yeah. And the Bible, the way the Bible came around. And the stories about Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, compared to the pro probably the real story of Jesus, which is very different, which is now just coming out through things like the Da Vinci Code. Yeah. Because yeah. um, it's encouraging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and Michael Feely as well. Michael Feely. Yeah, well, yeah, well, he's really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's a plug there for Michael. Yeah. <laughs> 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 plug here. <laughs> But there's distinct evidence to suggest that mm. the Quran, the Holy Quran, the foundational yeah. text of Islam, was written by the Vatican. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It certainly wasn't written mm. by the Prophet Muhammad. Was just like an illiterate peasant, mm. and, he, mm. you know, and he somehow though he had this message from an angel. And he wrote it in this book, and because of that, he went out and conquered half the world mm. within the next twenty years. I mean, it's it's mm. unlikely that someone, you know, he would have just been if if that really happened, right? He would just been laughed at like all the yeah. other. Yeah, people yeah. who claim to be prophets. <laughs> It'd be like the famous Monty Python scene where they're all lined up, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, where they're all lined up along the Wailing Wall, and they say all kind of dark. Yeah, and people yeah. just laughing at them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So the, the network, the secret society network, create a religion. It uses religion. Um, it uses religion as a, a tool of all kinds of ways to subvert yeah. our natural oh, yeah. spiritual yeah. instincts, also for political conflicts and things like that, which I think is what Islam has been used for in the world yes. today. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a big subject, but I think it is being used it's, as a tool for that today. Very likely at the moment, to yeah. It's being it's used really. as a weapon, mm. a psychological warfare and cultural warfare weapon. Mm. Um, so mm. there's all kinds of ways that government can use religion. And of course there's the priest. The priest. What's interesting about the Bible, I mean the Bible, the King James Bible, which is the English vernacular mm. version, is not the first English Bible. Mm. A guy called um, John, John Wycliffe, his name was, I believe. Mm. Um, I think 300 years earlier, he wrote a translation of the Bible from the Latin, Right here in Oxford. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> do you know what happened to him? He was lynched by a gang of priests. <laughs> really? Wow. So that's how they punished him. Mm. His Bible was destroyed. And um, the, uh, this, this says an awful lot, doesn't it? It mm. says that the priests don't want people reading these things for themselves. Because the, 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 <laughs> the Bible was all in Latin in those days. The Latin yeah. was, think about the Latin, the Latin was translated from the Greek. The Greek was translated from various things in Hebrew. <coughs> um, it was edited heavily by people like Saint Jerome, mm. and there's the Council of Nicaea, which oh, is where, yeah, yeah. Where, where basically Christianity was adopted by the Roman Empire. Mm. It was a pretty rough, I mean, 12 people got killed at the Council of Nicaea, mm. murdered. Mm. So it wasn't a civilised debate. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's where the Nicene Creed comes from, you know, yeah. every, people in church recite every service. Mm. Weird, weird world, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, mm. it's, it's a great black cycle there we just discussed, you know, we've gone around the... Yeah, mm. quite yeah. A lot of we have to talk about subjects, and but and mm. quite deep in sorts of subjects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, we'll have to time is upon us, I'm afraid. But yeah. well, I've, had, I've had a really good time. It's been I, fantastic. Yeah, we have, yeah. Really fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're gonna have to do another talk. Oh, yeah, we're gonna have to come back any time, guys. Yeah, yeah. come Thank back any time. It, it's I'll always a pleasure you. coming to see you, Ben. It's, it's good, good to see you. We always learn, always learn new stuff, and it's it's. It's good to get this stuff out as well. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, there's more to, there's more to yeah, it. Definitely. More to it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, hopefully we'll put the world to work, spread information out. And, yeah. and I think this is, it's, um, the truth will set you free, which is one of the good things we've mm. said in the Bible. Um, yeah. And it's true. I mean, it, it is essentially an information war, yeah, as Alex Jones says. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it means that really secrecy mm. is the armour mm. and it is the sword and the shield of this whole agenda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It depends on keeping things quiet and when things come out people not understanding them or ignoring them mm. and that's where pe conspiracy theorists mm. like us come in because we can break through that yeah. and we can disarm the agenda mm. if we if we are if we do our job right we can mm. disarm the agenda absolutely because a lot of things come along to bat away the truth don't yeah. Yeah. Away the things as, um, yeah. we're up against it but we keep going we will yeah that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Onwards and upwards. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Ben. Thanks, thanks Ben. Thank, thank you. you thanks, much. Johnny. Thanks, Paul. Thank, thank you very much. Back on Unite Planet. 
Hello. Hello! And thank you very much for watching the video. Really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, and I hope you did, please give it a little like. And of course, subscribe to our channel. We also have our Facebook account. The information is below. And the ways you can fund us is also down below. And remember, let's unite and not to fight. And together, we can unite this planet better. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.